CUNY TV is proud to bring you our new series, Latinas, which showcases not only our diversity, but also the movers and shakers, the brains and beauty, the tastemakers, and all of the wonderful women who are Latina. On this episode of Latinas, we go one-on-one -on -one with The Walking Dead's Lauren Ridloff, meet three-time Food Network chop champion, Chef Adriana Urbina, and get the truth behind diabetes myths. Welcome to Latinas, the show that's all about Nuestra Mujeres and the Latinx community. I'm Tina Beth Pina. We're here at the Cervantes Institute, a landmark building and cultural center right here in New York City, where you can learn to speak Spanish perfectly and a whole lot more. Now, though Lauren Ridloff doesn't speak Spanish, she does communicate through sign language. The Tony Award-nominated actress and former elementary school teacher, who's currently starring in The Walking Dead, told me all about her life as a multicultural woman and actor who just happens to be deaf. This scene is one of my favorite scenes we've shot so far because it really shows the audience and the world out there how capable deaf people are. I just find it interesting how very natural this whole experience acting-wise has been for you. It's as if you were born to do it. I come from a family that's very creative. My mother's an artist. My father was a musician. My sister is a dancer. Mm -hmm. I'm married to a poet. So I've always been surrounded by that creativity. And I've always felt this need to tell stories. I didn't know that I could act. But when I look back, it all makes sense to me. When people interview you, a lot of it is about being deaf and there's clearly more to you than just the deaf cultural aspect of you. You're African American, you're Mexican American. How did that influence you growing up? My father is Mexican. He was the first child born here in America. His brother and sisters were all born in Mexico. My dad grew up in an environment where everyone spoke Spanish and English, so he's bilingual. When he found out that his child was deaf, his first thought was, oh, okay, I've got to learn another language to communicate with my child. So that's what he did. Learning sign language came from his family cultural being appreciating bilingualism, and that affected me growing up. Did you grow up eating certain foods or doing certain dances? Yes, absolutely. My grandmother, my abuela, made the best enchiladas with mole sauce. Oh, that chocolate was so good. Are you passing along that culture to your sons as well? Absolutely. My boys, they're also Jewish because their father, my husband is a Russian Jew, so oh. I hope that my boys don't have to explain their backgrounds as much as we have needed to today, right? How proud are you to be multicultural? How proud are you to be Latina? I love having an intersectional identity. I feel that allows me to reach out and connect with more people out there. Sure. There's more opportunities to share with other people and share something we share experiences. I love that. It makes me feel like I'm a good storyteller. Do you have any advice for young women who face the same situation as you being a deaf child in a hearing world? My advice to young women would be to stay true to yourself. And it is okay if sometimes you feel like you're not sure of how to behave or how to be or how to speak with a certain group of people, that, that's okay. You can be quiet at that moment and just observe because that's good too. You'll see Lauren on the big screen next year playing Makari, Marvel's first deaf superhero in the highly anticipated film, The Eternals. The 2018 midterm elections brought in a female wave that increased the number of women elected into office. Despite the gains, numbers show Latinas are still underrepresented in politics. Marlene Parata has the story. The year 2018 was historic. 
the elections at the state and federal level brought in a wave of new, more diverse, and younger group of female politicians, which included a Latina of Puerto Rican roots by the name of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. In New York State, we also got women like Assemblywoman Catalina Cruz, the first former dreamer to be elected to office in the country. But has that wave made a difference when it comes to Latina representation in office? I do not think we have enough uh, Latinas in power. We've seen some incredible Latinas elected to the state office. Obviously, we know that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is now in Congress, so that obviously has amplified our voice, uh, but we're still underrepresented. Latinos are the largest minority in New York State and in the nation, but make up only less than 2% of those elected to Congress and state offices. If broken down by gender, the number of Latinas is even smaller. In the city council at a local level here in the city of New York, we only have 12 women out of 51 members. And when I came into office over 13 years ago at this point, there were 18 women. Despite extremely low numbers, Mark Viverito, who made history as the first Latina to hold citywide office in New York, sees hope in this new wave of women in politics. When I became speaker uh, in 2014, I started raising the alarm here in the city of New York, saying, Mira, we don't have enough women, right? We don't have enough women in office, we need to run. Then we've seen, obviously, the midterm elections, that surge of women. Uh, the greatest number of women of color to be elected to Congress. We have seen women stepping up. Amanda Farias is one of those young Latinas stepping up. The 29-year-old Bronx native with Puerto Rican and Dominican roots ran for the first time in 2017 for the then open city council seat in District 18. We met her in Midtown Manhattan near her job at the Consortium for Worker Education. Yeah, so I was in a really interesting predicament. <laughs> Though my seat was an open seat, I did have a five-way race. I was the youngest candidate, the only woman, um, and I ran against a almost 30-year, what was like an incumbent-style race because a state senator, uh, Ruben Diaz Sr., jumped into the race along with three other men from the district. And we were all, you know, vying for the Democratic uh, nomination for the primary. Um, so it was an interesting dynamic. Back then, she lost to incumbent and veteran politician Ruben Diaz Sr., but that's not stopping her. She's running again against him in 2021. Uh, we came in with almost 22% of the vote in a five-way race. Um, that shows that the people in the community want the change, right? They desire new leadership. They actually believe in women, um, and we're willing to show up for, for a first-time candidate, a young woman. Um, like All of those challenges that were there, they. They were countered by the amount of people that actually showed up for me to vote. The year 2021 poses a huge opportunity to increase the number of Latinas in elected office. There will be citywide elections, which include for mayor, for borough president, and also at the city council level, there will be at least 34 open seats from outgoing council members who cannot seek re-election. Just days after we interviewed Melissa Marvi Verrito, she also announced she's running, this time to replace Congressman Jose Serrano in the South Bronx. For Latinas, this is Marlene Peralta. Ileana Ross Leighton is a politician and lobbyist from Miami, Florida, who became the first Latina in Congress when she was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1989. Ileana was born in Havana, Cuba, and emigrated to the U.S. when she was seven years old and began her political career when she was elected to the Florida House of Representatives in 1982 and to the Florida Senate in 1986. In 1989, she won a special election and became the first Cuban-American and Latina elected to Congress. Throughout her career, Ross Leightonen worked to advocate for women and lead the way for other women to run for public office and was the chairwoman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee from 2011 to 2013. A true political pioneer in every sense, Eliana announced her retirement this year after nearly 40 years of service to her constituents. Eliana Ross Leightonen is today's Badass Latina. Making rice is a, it's a big staple, and being Puerto Rican, and for a lot of people, like being Latina, 
And every time I would make it, it would either come out like mashed potatoes, like that mushy, or grainy, disgusting. I actually learned because one of my side hustles is nannying. One of the families I work for, the mom happens to be Boricua. So she taught me how to make rice. When I learned how to make rice, I couldn't stop making white rice at home. There would be random like Tupperware just full of rice piling up in the refrigerator because I was just so proud of the texture of my rice. I finally got it down. It is a science, cooking is a science. And I told my mom that I finally, finally became a grown up. <laughs> I can make rice. My name is Melissa Garay and I am New Yorican. Now food is a universal language that people from any part of the world can relate to. And Venezolana Adriana Urbina has made quite a name for herself in the world of food. She's the only Latina chef to have not only won the Food Network show Chopped, but she did it three times. Let's meet her. As a kid, my dream job was to be a cook and make people happy through my passion. I was in high school, I hated school. So the only thing that got me motivated was cooking. Every time that I was sad, when I was happy, when I was any type of emotion, being in the kitchen helped me going through that. But my family got to one point that they were saying like, listen, you don't like to study and you love cooking, so you have to be the best in order to go to take that road. So I say, okay, I'm gonna do it. I'll, I'll be the best, I'll try. Well, I'm from Venezuela, I'm from the city, Caracas, and I really miss the support and the warmth from the Latino community. What I absolutely love about New York is the diversity, all the cultures, and I feel like I'm learning every day from different cultures. So I'm living in one country, but I, I, I feel like I'm living in 10 different countries. I'm constantly learning and pushing myself because everyone is so work-driven and that pushed me to like wanting to be better every day. Well, after working in all these mission star restaurants with all these amazing ingredients and I felt like something, I was missing something inside of me and that I needed to go back to my roots. That was the most important thing, to cook food with meaning that meant something to me. And that's Latin American food. Like, that's what I love to cook. That's what I grew up eating. So I wanted it to also create awareness of what was happening in Venezuela and in different parts of Latin America. So I felt like it was perfect to start doing a pop-up dinner to promote uh, my culture, our culture, Latin American culture that is so beautiful um, and that a lot of people don't know how amazing it is. I think one of the most important things that I want to keep promoting is to work together as females. Like as women, we need to support each other and thinking that we can all succeed if we support each other, not competing against each other. And that's one of the most important things. And the other thing is like, never be afraid of showing who you are and believing in you, in yourself and speaking up. That's very important, speaking up. I'm Adrián Urbina and I'm a chef and I'm Latina. We've all heard it from our tías, la diabetes. But what do we really know about diabetes and its effects on Latinas? Elena Romero went to find out and dispel some common diabetes myths. Right now, there are 30 million Americans living with diabetes, and there are 1.5 million new cases of diabetes diagnosed each year. The numbers are staggering. I went to the Center for Comprehensive Health Practice to talk to Dr. Marieli Fernandez about what Latinas need to know. There's three main forms of diabetes. There's type one, type two, and then gestational diabetes or diabetes of pregnancy. So for type one diabetes, that's actually caused by an immune process where your own body um, attacks the cells that produce insulin. And insulin is a hormone 
that we make that moves the sugar that we eat out of the bloodstream and into cells so they can be used as energy. Type 2 diabetes is caused by a combination of genetics and lifestyle choices and Latinos are actually at an increased risk for developing type 2 diabetes. Gestational diabetes is diabetes of pregnancy where the mom while pregnant um, develops like elevated sugar levels and diabetes. And although all are caused by different things, all three can lead to very serious complications. So let's discuss some diabetes myths. Myth, sugar is the cause of diabetes. Not true, but sugar alone is not the only cause. You know, the thing is that usually high levels of sugar um, go along with eating unhealthy foods, little to no physical activity. Um, but again, type 2 diabetes is also caused by genetics as well. So being Latina also predisposes you to type 2 diabetes. Myth. Children do not get diabetes. Unfortunately, children can get both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, and Latino children are actually at an increased risk for developing type 2 diabetes. With healthy eating and exercise, you can definitely prevent it. You know, but unfortunately, once you have the diagnosis of diabetes, you can't really outgrow it. Myth. Getting diabetes is an act of God, and there is nothing I can do to stop its onset. Like my mother says, you know, ayúdate y Dios te ayudará. It's kind of like, help yourself and God will help you. So you can do some things to prevent type 2 diabetes. Again, it's caused by a combination of things, genetic and lifestyle. So if you exercise more every day, at least 30 minutes, two to three times a week. If you try to eat healthier foods, I think those things can help you keep a healthy weight and a healthy weight can prevent you against developing type 2 diabetes. For more information on diabetes, Dr. Fernandez recommends logging on to the American Diabetes Association's website, diabetes.org. For Latinas, I'm Elena Romero. We're part of my culture, I'm very proud of. I think the, the values and the morals I grew up with. Spaniards shout a lot, so I'm not very proud of that. And we get into kind of like arguments and the national sport is to complain. I really love music. I mean, uh, mariachi, there's some uh, Mexican salsa that I love, so yeah, music. Hablas Español? Do you speak Spanish? Does speaking Spanish make you more Latina? Listen in as four women discuss the ultimate question, are you Latina enough? On today's Caliente Caliente. I used to date a guy and his family used to always be like, you're not Hispanic enough because you don't do this or... Mm -hmm. they, they got mad at me because I didn't like arepas. I have to keep telling people I'm Puerto Rican and they're just like, no you're not. Either I get, you're too, you're either just white or you're just Hispanic and it's like, whoa, I can't pick one, like I'm both. I grew up in a really small town in Massachusetts. My dad is from Cuba, he was born in Cuba. He didn't speak Spanish to us. When I was a kid, my mom said that she didn't teach us Spanish because she learned Spanish as a first language and she didn't like being an ESL student but I've also heard that they enjoyed having private conversations in Spanish where me and my brother couldn't partake or listen to. I think it's definitely dying out in my family because um, me and my brother, we don't speak Spanish. My cousins, I think most of them don't really speak Spanish except for one because she grew up in Puerto Rico. And that's some of my cousins, they're a lot older than me and they're having kids and those kids do not understand a lick of Spanish yes. at all. They are just straight English mm -hmm. all the time. They don't need, I think they even say grandma, they don't even say like abuela anymore. In kindergarten, I was in the bilingual class when I was in elementary school in the Lower East Side. So first grade and second, no, kindergarten and first grade, I was in that bilingual class. Then starting in second grade, I was in the regular English language class. It's so complicated, this topic, because even though you might speak Spanish, then for example, my Dominican family in Dominican Republic might I say might say I'm not Dominicana enough, you know, so you're never enough of something. It's weird how people like test like the barometer of like, oh, you need to do this to be this, you need yeah. to do that to do that. Mm -hmm. And somehow being Puerto Rican, Dominican and biracial, I may mean, I should not fit enough of any of those categories. So I'm like simultaneously included and denied from all of those groups, which is just oddly upsetting. What makes us Latina then? I think it's like the way you grew up. Like the, the way my parents talk to me, not specific to their language, 
the way you're raised, the foods you eat, the way you celebrate things, the holidays you celebrate. I don't think it has to just be language. I guess part of it is like knowing what your parents struggled through and what your grandparents, just knowing your roots and like how, what the history was behind that. I think with the other um, Latinas that I'm close with, there's some commonality. Definitely humility and hard work um, are huge. Being Latina is definitely more than just the language. It is by the culture that we live in. I think it starts with accepting and knowing our history, our roots. And that's another reason I think now that the Afro-Latina movement is happening because so many people are recognizing that and embracing it. If I ever have kids, I would want them to speak Spanish. Those are the things that kind of continue to keep our culture alive. And not to talk politics, but in this political climate, I think it's so important for us to even be more proud of who we are. And, you know, if it continues with the language or the culture, we have to let other people know who we are, that we are here. And doing that with the language or with the music or the food, I think is super important. I disagree with the part you were saying about how in the political climate we have to save tradition. Because, I mean, I screw the politics. I think tradition is part of culture, but I think culture can evolve which I think is a big part of certain Latinas not speaking Spanish or certain people not doing exactly the, exactly the same thing their family did. And I think tradition can change and I think you could keep the roots of it, but you can let it evolve also. And I think there should be room for evolution. Two years ago this month, Hurricane Maria wreaked havoc on Puerto Rico. And although the island is currently in a period of political uncertainty, artists are trying to make a difference, which makes their work more important than ever. Here's a sneak peek at animator Alba Garcia's short film, Yo Soy Taino, where puppets tell the story of an abuela and her granddaughter surviving the hurricane. Abuela Yaya, ¿tú crees que sobreviviremos? Nena, ven aquí. Los poricuas no nos quitamos, nos levantamos. Pero tengo miedo. Escúchame bien, Marabeli. Nuestros ancestros cuidaban y protegían nuestra tierra abundante. Oh, ya veo. ¿Qué te pasa, Marabeli? Abuela, tú dices que los taínos existen. Entonces, ¿dónde están? Ay, bendito. Mira, hay una aquí. ¿Cómo se dice? Yo soy taíno. Tacto taíno. If you want to intern abroad and learn some business skills at the same time, you have got to meet Lisette Miranda. She empowers young women to intern in Spain in an effort to give them a more professional and competitive edge on their resumes. And she's today's Latina on the rise. The more you travel and the more you have conversations with people, the more you'll realize we are more alike than we are different. Lisette Miranda is the CEO and founder of Pink International, an internship program specifically designed for young women to travel to Spain to connect with their inner leader and become global citizens. For young women, when they go abroad, they get their soft, their soft skills become empowered. They become empowered and then they come back to their campus, their communities, their friends, their family, and they bring back value. Ironically, the native New Yorker never actually studied or interned abroad herself. But the seed of her idea for Pink, which stands for Professional Immersions for Networking and Connections, began when she was living and working in Spain after graduating from college. I was living in Madrid, working in international education, and I'd come across students from across the globe, whether they were teaching English, studying abroad, interning abroad, on pairing, gap year, and I kept having these amazing conversations and listening to what they liked about their programs and what they kind of felt was falling short. And in that moment, that's when I thought of Pink International. Lisette moved back to the States and Pink International became official in 2014 and has been bridging the gender gap through cultural immersion and intercultural communication ever since. Some days this is like a dream and other days I feel like I'm drowning in a cup of water. Uh, but that's the beauty of owning a business and creating something that's yours. You have the power to make it as big as you want. Lisette's been meeting those challenges head on and has been named one of the top three mentors of the year in the United States and is one of the top women in international education. Lisette attributes the root of her success to her family, specifically her father. 
he immigrated to the, to the United States um, when he was 20 years old um, from Bolivia to know that if he could do it as a 20 year old um, coming from a third world country from Bolivia to New York and here I was 24 um, with a college education from a first world country with a lot of privileges. If he could do it, I absolutely could do it as well. And his time here in the States gives me another a, a deeper appreciation for what he has accomplished here for the family. Clearly the recipe for success is in her blood and Lisette is definitely making her family proud by bridging the gender gap one in turn at a time. When I get the emails from students that have said you've changed the course of my life, whether it's changing my major or realizing I have these other capabilities, um, it, they both feel simultaneously so valuable. There are no GPA requirements for pink internships and there's financial aid opportunities available as well. Plus, you don't even have to know how to speak Spanish to apply. For more information, log on to Pink's website at pinkinternational.com. And that's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, log on to our website at tv.cuny.edu or check out our social media profiles. We're delighted to share our Latina stories with you. And make sure you tune in next month where you'll meet influencer Stephanie Flor, visit Susie Jaramillo's World of Canticos, and so much more. Hasta la próxima. Bye-bye.